Hey guys. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I just, I got this rash though, and it is like over my whole body, right? Uh, and the doctor said, don't scratch it or it'll spread. And let me tell you, he was right. <laughs> wow. I'm, I mean, it makes it uncomfortable even wearing these clothes right now, to be honest. Um, I, brought, I brought a picture of it in case you can't, you can't tell from here. Uh, I'm kidding. What kind of... I'm just, <laughs> just, there's, no, there's no picture. I don't even really have a rash, okay? Just everyone, everyone can calm down. I do have to admit something, though. I did break my regular glasses, though, because I fell asleep on the couch watching Office reruns. <laughs> and the only spare glasses I have are like these old dad glasses from the 80s, and um, I need you not to judge me, but that's, I need these to see my notes. And uh, applause, spontaneous from the crowd. That is great. 1987 called, they want their swagger back. Um, <laughs> Okay, but the rash thing though, right? Like, does anyone here know someone who offers like just a little bit TMI? Like they just, it's just a little over the top. And I, I sometimes feel like when it comes to this topic of authenticity, don't we tend to fit in like one of two extremes? Either like there's one camp where they're like, ah, authenticity, vulnerability, that's like not really my thing, right? Maybe like deep down is sort of is just a, a scary thing for you to do. And maybe on the other side, maybe you're just a person that every person that you meet in line to get coffee, you're just oversharing every life detail that you can think of. Now, obviously, authenticity is more than just sharing like personal data. But I, I think, though, that not only do we long for true, authentic connection, I think we're wired for it. In Christian theology, uh, God is described as what we call Trinitarian, three in one. And in the Trinity, we see that God himself exists in this constant, authentic community with himself. So, so really, simply put, if we're made in the image and likeness of this three in one God, it makes sense then that at our very core, at the heart level, all of us in this room would desire for deep, authentic connection. But has anyone ever found that to be a little harder than you thought? Like real, true, authentic connection? Well, the Apostle Paul describes it this way. This is what he says. It says, from him, being Jesus, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So he describes this as, like a, like a, as a body. And as we do the work together, we grow together. So in this series, as John mentioned, uh, we're calling it Next Level. And uh, as a quick caveat, for those of you who are like sitting there thinking, finally, I'm gonna get some like pastoral advice for how to get out of the friend zone in that relationship. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint, that's not what we're talking about. What we are talking about is cultivating and deepening those most significant relationships taking those relationships like below the surface of sort of like, hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? Like we just read though, Paul reminds us that in order to have these kinds of relationships, each part must do its work. This probably isn't a surprise to anyone here. Like this kind of authenticity, it, it doesn't just happen, does it? It's not like, it's not automatic. You don't usually fall backwards into like deep, meaningful relationships. Last week we learned that next level friendships start with availability. But that kind of relationship doesn't just happen by being present and accounted for. Has anyone ever had coffee with someone who was like physically there but they were like not so much there? They're either checking their phone or looking over your shoulder. Like being available, being present starts the process, but we have to go to the next step. We need to move to authenticity. Now, one story in the Bible uh, that I think actually illustrates this pretty beautifully is the story of a guy named Jonathan and a guy named David. Now, looking at their story, though, it, it's, it's actually a pretty surprising friendship. You have the son of a king, and then you have a shepherd boy. 
But there's actually a lesser known story about Jonathan that I think sheds some light. In uh, 1 Samuel 14, before David is even mentioned in the Bible, we find the Israelites in a pretty bad place. Um, they've been defeated multiple times. Their army is small. Their king, Saul, had not brought the deliverance that really the country had hoped that he would bring. So the Israelites are, are kind of scared. They're sort of like in hiding at this point. And one day, King Saul's son, Jonathan, decides that he, he just can't sit by any longer as these enemies taunt him. Here's what it says. Jonathan says, let's, uh, let's cross over to the camp of those heathen Philistines. Really, the word heathen makes every threat just a little more intense, doesn't it? <laughs> Which Philistines? Oh, the, hill, the, the heathen ones, great. Maybe the Lord will help us. If he does, nothing can keep him from giving us the victory, no matter how few of us there are. Okay, so real talk, like, <laughs> not the most inspiring challenge, right? Maybe he'll give us the victory. Maybe we'll go and get slaughtered. No one, no one really... No, so here's, here's Jonathan's big plan. <laughs> Let's head over to their garrison, and uh, if they invite us up, that'll be a sign from God that God has given us the victory. That, that'll be our sign. So he goes with the, uh, the armor bearer, and it's exactly that happens. The Philistines say, hey, come on up. Um, we wanna tell you something, more or less. And Here's what happens. So as Jonathan and the armor bearer like head into battle, there's this massive earthquake. And the earthquake is so big and so unnerving that the Philistines believe that their army is actually way bigger than it actually is. And in their panic, they start fighting each other. So this earthquake is kind of throwing everyone for a tizzy. They start fighting each other and the Israelites win the battle and the Philistines are driven back to their own country. So it's, it's kind of no wonder then that 15 years later, Jonathan would be impressed by David, who uh, as a small, young shepherd boy is standing before the giant Philistine Goliath with nothing but a small slingshot and huge faith in God. In 1 Samuel 18, we read this. Jonathan was deeply impressed with David. An immediate bond was forged between them. He became totally committed to David. From that point on, he would be David's number one advocate and friend. His number one advocate and friend. As the current prince of Israel, I think Jonathan could have resented the fact that God picked David to be the next king. But because of Jonathan's selflessness, though, a beautiful friendship was forged. And through the years, David and Jonathan actually share really openly with each other. They share their fears, they share their struggles. It, it really is this like next level friendship, as surprising as it may be. Now, King Saul becomes so intensely jealous of David that like on multiple occasions, he tries to kill David, which like time out, um, how many friendships would survive like the other friend's dad trying to kill them, right? Like it kind of puts a damper on things, right? Like holidays are a bit awkward in those households. But David still chooses to trust Jonathan. And here's the thing that I I want you to really get this morning. David's authenticity gave Jonathan an opportunity to meet his friend's need. 1 Samuel 23. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. So there's a lot of just realism in this passage, right? So David's like this... The king wants to kill me, and that's got me, I don't know, like a little bit stressed out. And Jonathan, Saul's son, doesn't just sort of like pat him on the back, right? He's like, hey, uh, God will never give you more than you can handle, bro. Like that is, you just need to let go and let God, right? <laughs> Closes the door, opens a chimney or whatever, whatever they had then. I, um, <laughs> The text literally says he strengthened his hand in God. Man, I I love that idea, that definition of a next level friendship. It's not just someone that offers platitudes and sanctimonies. This is someone that strengthens us in the truth of who we are. Jonathan says, listen, David, I know you're freaked out. I know you're worried, but don't forget the promises of God. Couldn't some of us use a friend like that 
that we're like, when we're in the thick of it, that friend that says, hey, I know that you're freaking out. I know that you're underwater right now. Don't forget the promises of God. Don't forget how he came through for you in the past. I'm with you in this and so is God. We can be that for each other. We can stand together in that kind of way. I remember uh, in college, um, I had a season where stuff just sort of unraveled for me, to be honest. Like, it was just a really difficult, emotional, spiritual season. And I don't know if any of you are like this, but like, when the bottom starts to drop out for me, I just, I just withdraw. Like, I just sort of kind of hide my, my cave and I begin to kind of put walls up and I was like, I was burning bridges and I was, it was a really messy season. And it, it got to the point where I was like, man, I, I gotta do something about this or I'm gonna implode. And um, I knew who my Jonathan was. And I called him up, he came over, and I, I just kind of spilled the whole raw, uncut story to him. And he, he didn't offer any pithy truisms. He didn't try to like make it go away. He just, he just sat with me, he wept with me, and he reminded me of the promises of God. And it didn't make everything instantly better. But I'll tell you what, though, in that moment, I knew I had a friend for life. I knew that I needed this person. And years later, I was able to be that for him. I found truth, and I also found grace. And because of it, I not only grew closer to this friend, I also grew closer to God. Now, here's what I know to be true. Um, It doesn't always go that way, does it? Anyone ever like tried to be real with someone and it like didn't pan out the way that you wanted it to, right? Someone betrayed a trust or they offered like really terrible advice or they, whatever. Like we, we all have scars uh, with regards to our pursuit of authenticity. And I, I think as a result, we all have barriers to authenticity. So I wanna, I wanna unpack a couple of those, some of the barriers that I think we hide behind. Um, your barrier might be people pleasing, Maybe you feel this like relentless desire to be liked by others and so allowing your true self to ever be seen or heard is actually really difficult because you, you just want everyone else to be happy. Any, any people pleasers in the room? Yeah, like sometimes you have a hard time saying no, right? Because you want everyone else to be happy and so maybe you just keep on taking more and more and more and more things and if you're really honest with yourself, like you're here this morning and you're like, I'm, I'm done, I'm exhausted. I'm cooked like that. I don't have anything else to give. Maybe, uh, maybe the barrier is comparison. Anyone here ever compare themselves to someone else? Maybe you say things like, oh, she's so much better at that or he's so much more creative or just a way better leader than I am. When we compare ourselves to others, I think we often just feel like we don't measure up, Right? We spend so much time focusing on, on what we're not that we kind of have this perpetual sense that like I'm, I'm just not good enough. And I think that can keep us from being truly authentic because ultimately we fear that others will see our shortfalls too, right? And if someone really saw how not good I am at this thing or how much I struggle in this area, I don't, I don't know what I would do. Maybe the barrier is perfectionism. Perfectionists can't make peace with their vulnerabilities. They need to strive for perfection or at least the appearance of perfection. We've all been this person at some point in our life. And when we can't accept imperfections, the last thing we wanna do is let our authentic self be seen, right? It's that social media, it's the best house, it's the best car, it's the best salary, it's the best family, it's the best Christmas, whatever it is, we want everyone to know that like we're crushing it in this household. We're doing a great job over here. The last barrier that I'll talk about is uh, workaholism. Now, this one might surprise you because this one feels a little different than the other ones on the list, but I, I think this one's actually really, really sneaky. Because when we fall into this trap of like constantly working, constantly being busy, constantly having something to do, um, has anyone ever been in that place and you found it hard to actually be authentically you in any environment? There's always something to do. There's always something on the schedule. There's always an appointment or a calendar, a project, something that has to be accomplished. And we can get so caught up in doing all these things. We really become a human doing and not a human being, right? Like you you forget, who, who am I 
Actually, at the core of all of these, though, I think is fear. It's the fear of being seen. So how, how do we actually work through these then? Right? Maybe your exact barrier wasn't on that list, but you can certainly identify something that's keeping you from authenticity. How, how do we actually break through those barriers? I think first, we have to make the courageous choice. And I say courageous because if the fear is truly being known, then allowing yourself to be known is a courageous step because you're giving someone the opportunity to hurt you, to disappoint you, to double cross you, to let you down. Brene Brown puts it this way, I think she puts it brilliantly. She said, authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true selves be seen. And I love that idea of it being a collection of choices because it isn't just like leaving here and spilling your guts to some random stranger like, I did it, I'm authentic now, right? This weirdo stranger knows everything about me. No, it's, it's a collection of choices every single day to let our true selves be known. And not just with anyone, by the way. This is really best with like someone, maybe a collection of someone that you have relational equity with. There's safety and trust there. I think uh, personally, an ideal environment for this is small groups. Small groups for us, if you've ever uh, looked anywhere on our website or any of our materials, like we put a lot of eggs in the small groups basket. Small groups are groups of like six to 15 people. Some meet in this building, some meet in homes for the purpose of like doing life together, like being in each other's lives. If you've never joined a small group before, I cannot encourage you enough to do so. In fact, we made it really, really easy for you to do that. Uh, to join a small group, you text the word SG info for small group information to the number 313131. You can do that right now if you want. I won't be offended. It'll send you back a link. You fill out that link, and someone from our small groups team will get back to you ASAP to help you find a group that best fits your needs and your schedule and your location. Honestly, joining a small group is one of the best things I ever did. It's not always easy. Sometimes they, you know, call me on stuff, get in my face. But it, it is what, absolutely worth it. So I wanna, I wanna challenge us to, uh, to choose authenticity in three ways. The first is this. I want us to choose authentic emotions. Choose authentic emotions. I think authenticity begins by allowing ourselves to actually own what it is that we're feeling. Christians have this weird habit sometimes of like, pretending that stuff's going, that's, that is going on, isn't really going on. Anyone, know, anyone, ever, anyone ever like put on a, a church smile before? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You were like screaming in the van on the way over, but as soon as you walk through the doors, you're like, Christmas time. <laughs> Me and my family with matching plaid outfits, right? Like we, uh, uh, right? The moment you get back to the van, what happens? Right. <laughs> exactly. Mom, are you here? Yeah. Um, we go right back to what's really going on. Why do we do this to ourselves? Somewhere in Christendom, we've like convinced ourselves like, wow, I love Jesus, so I can't ever be angry or sad or confused or dare I say, depressed. I mean, have you read the Bible? <laughs> the Bible has all of those emotions and then some covered. We, ha we have to start by being honest. Like, what's, okay, what's really going on in my heart, give yourself the grace to feel sadness, to feel anger, to feel joy, to feel sorrow, to feel doubt, to feel confusion. We gotta choose authentic emotions. Number two, we gotta choose authentic words. Uh, okay, so I'm sure this has never happened to anyone here, but has anyone in this room, when asked, how are you, said fine, when you weren't in fact, wait for it, actually fine, anyone? Anyone done that like this morning? <laughs> yeah, you were in the screaming van, right? You came, hey, how are you? Fine, you don't seem fine, golly. We do this all the time. Now again, I'm not saying unload your deepest, darkest secrets to every single person who asks, hey, how are you? Because you'll get a restraining order. That's not, that's not ideal but we need to strive to be authentic with our words when we're in the context of safe relationship. Paul wrote a letter to the church in Galatia and here's what he said. 
He said, carry each other's burdens, and in this, uh, in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So without parsing any verbs here, how are we supposed to carry one another's burdens if we don't actually know what they are? Right? Paul doesn't say, hey, carry one another's burdens if you want a gold star. If you if you want to be an A-plus Christian. He's like, no, 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 there's something, there's something with the law of Christ wrapped up in how we actually care for each other. This isn't just like, oh, this is good Christian practice. He's like, no, no, this is like wrapped up in like the fullness of life that Jesus came to bring. How can we do that if we don't actually know each other's burdens? Pay attention to those times that you're insincere with your speech, that you're given lip service just because you don't want to deal with the hassle. One exercise you can try with your group is this. You can fill in this blank. If you really knew me, you'd know this. It's, okay, it's not a mind-blowing exercise, I realize that. But it does a couple of things. One, um, it, it gives you an opportunity to, like, to really prompt maybe some of that stuff that's going on beneath the surface, but it also helps build trust and confidence in your group. It helps bring unity and intimacy with the people that you trust. Lastly, I wanna challenge us to choose authentic actions. Choose authentic actions. Now, this one will, I think, likely look as different to all of us as there are people. We're diverse people. I think we often feel out of sync, though, when we're acting inauthentically. I would say, just as your pastor and as your friend, pay attention to those hunches. I actually really believe that like, God will prompt us. He'll, he'll nudge us. When we're behaving in a way that isn't actually true to who we are or what's going on, like, I think we feel it. And maybe some of us, have, we've gotten so good at the charade that that feeling is way, way deep down. But I think if we begin to listen, if we begin to pay attention, like, man, I'm, I'm acting out of sync. And living authentically, it, it may at times require you to make an unpopular decision or to acknowledge parts of your heart that you'd rather hide away. But in the end, I... It's the only way to live like authentically is by being honest about what's going on in our lives. Authenticity will help us grow in the meaningful relationships that we were created for. As we do the work, as we open up, as we're honest with one another, we will learn to stand with one another even in discouraging circumstances. And ultimately, here's, here's the kicker for me. Living authentically isn't, it's not about like, oh, five steps to a cheerier Christian life. It's not like, here's a couple of tools, some questions you can ask. I, I think it's way more profound than that. I think living authentically is about living as we were created to be. Ultimately, that's the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus isn't this guy that came down from the sky and like handed over a whole bunch more lists of things we have to do in order to be loved by God. He says, listen, I've come so that you can opt out of the rat race. You can hop off the treadmill of pretending to be smarter or happier or wealthier or more successful than you actually are. The beauty of Jesus is that he looks at every single one of us and says, listen, I know your garbage better than even you do. And yet, I, I call you my son. I call you my daughter. Just come to me, any of you who are feeling tired, beat up, overwhelmed, in over your head. And I'm, I'm not gonna give you rebuke. I'm gonna give you rest. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the fullness of life. That's what living authentically is about. It's saying, man, I'm not, I'm not saved by how good I pretend to be to you. I'm saved by the good work and the finished work of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. When we can choose to be that for one another, when we can be a Jonathan to the Davids, when we can seek Jonathans when we're David, when we can speak truth into each other's life and say, listen, I'm not, I'm not pretending that this isn't hard right now, that this isn't difficult, that this isn't weighty, I'm not going anywhere. I'm with you in this, and so is God. That's, I believe, where true authenticity, authenticity begins. Let's pray. God, thank you. Um, 
that you invite us to a life that I think, if I'm really honest, I don't know that I would have had the courage to live on my own. God, and the freedom to know that there's not a single part of our heart that's hidden from you, that you see it all, and yet you love us with an unthinkable love. God, we know that we don't deserve that, and yet you give it to us freely in Jesus. What a miracle that is. Thank you, God, for loving us, for pursuing us, for being patient with us, even when we put up all our walls. Help us to be authentic with each other and with you. We thank you and we love you. And we pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.